Mr. Cohen. I don't see him. Hi. Hello. Hi, Dr. McDougall. Hello there. We're just going to test it before we get started. So could you say something to us? Hello. That's <laughs> wonderful. Can everybody hear yeah. that? Yeah. That's okay, great. so we'd ask everybody to get in their seats, please. So how many people do you have? We have um, I think 30. Just over 30. Just over 30 people. Okay, good. And you just wanted to answer questions? or you? I mean, how much do these people know about me? Um, well, you're notoriously wonderful here. We know okay. about you because uh, we follow um, a lot of your work and Dr. Esselstyn's work in particular. And we do an oil-free whole plant-based potluck once a month. Oh, nice. My name is Kate McGoy-Smith and my husband, Andrew. I'm, uh, Andrew yeah. And we went down to Santa Rosa, California in December 1st of 2012. Oh, and good. We recently published a paper reversing pulmonary hypertension, diabetic retinopathy, and- um, Wonderful. Are you, are you scientists or physicians or how did you get to do this? Um, well, I have, I'm a former nurse. I'm a master's in clinical social work and All right. as a PhD in chemistry. In chemistry, like Linus Pauling. I'm not a- So I, where, where did you get it published? It was published uh, in September's issue. I did send you a copy in September's issue of the International Journal of Disease Reversal and Prevention. Our, oh, oh, that's the uh, new ACLM journal. Yes, that's and right. our, um, our examiner was um, Dr. Kim uh, Williams. He was oh, good. nice. He was a referee. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, very good. Excellent. Well, you may have sent me the paper, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, thank yeah. you. You, you, I, we mentioned you, we mentioned the work that you do in our paper and what a difference it made. We went to the five day program, but the very first one I believe you have. Oh, good. Well, we're still running programs, I'm still very active. So, this is our Thanksgiving coming up, and we have people here who are plant curious to plant committed, and uh. You know, they're sometimes dealing with a divided table of people eating the standard American diet and then wanting to go whole plant based for their health. And we've also asked them to um, share some questions with us. So that's their background. Good deal. Well, uh, what time would you like to get started? We're going to get started right now. So do people so want to move forward? And can you move forward so Dr. McDougall can see you in the chairs, please? Thank you. Oh, no question. Oh, okay. Okay. thank you. Okay, so yeah, that'd be good, nice. It looks like it's very beautiful there right now. We have well, snow, or had yeah. snow. Where are you at? We're in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Oh, wow. Oh, that's beautiful. That's gorgeous. That's where I am right now. Yeah, that's beautiful. It'll get, it'll get dark here in a few minutes. And yeah. yeah. Then the skylight will be beautiful. Oh, yeah, that's yes, beautiful, yeah. yeah. Anyway, good. Well, yeah. we are, uh, yeah. So welcome, everybody. And please, uh, if we can give a round of applause to welcome Dr. McDougall. Holly, <laughs> I haven't even gotten started yet. <laughs> well, I changed your mind and want to take that back. <laughs> I don't think so. So, um, I'm going to start reading the questions now in no particular right. order. So the first question is, white potatoes, the Framingham study seemed to indicate they may not be the best. Your comment. I don't know why not? I mean, potatoes have been the pillar of worldwide nutrition for tens of thousands of years. Why would they all of a sudden become bad? Uh, they're, I believe, the fourth leading crop in the world. And uh, they can be grown at high and low elevations. They can be grown in all kinds of climates. Uh, the potato may save the world. Uh, in 2008, it was the uh, uh, World Health Organization that named the potato the International Year of the Potato. Because the World Health Organization revealed in the year 2008 that we were in big trouble. That was 11 years ago. And that our society may survive 
whether or not uh, the potato is available. Uh, it may be the crop that saves the human race. So it's, a, it's a, a, a crop that people have lived on for you know, millions of people for thousands of years. There are four to 600 different species of potatoes in the Andes. And uh, I don't know why anybody would malign the potato, but they do. Uh, it's, I, I guess, you know, the old cliche is they malign it because of the butter and the bacon that you put on top. Great. Yeah. Potato is great food. It's the anti-scurvy vitamin. You can live on potatoes and, or anti-scurvy food because it has vitamin C. You can live on potatoes and water alone. Wow. So, yeah, you know, it's a great food. Uh, we, they've actually raised people for periods of six months and a year and a half in, uh, in uh, clinical settings and found them to be in excellent health on a diet of, of virtually potatoes only. Right. Yeah. And I also understand out of Australia, there's a, a SATI index study that shows that just plain white potatoes have the highest SATI uh, in the index of all foods. So yeah, that's true. Potatoes, uh, that work was done by Susan. God, who did that work? Anyway. It was published, uh, I'm very familiar with it. Yes. Yeah. Society of potatoes compared to say croissants or something. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, They're good. I mean, I could live literally on mashed potatoes. We were going to have tonight, I, we had mashed potatoes tonight. We actually went down, uh, here I'll show you where we went. See that restaurant down there? Yes. Yep. No, well that restaurant, you see those boats down there? Yes. Yep. All right, well right in front of those boats, it's a restaurant. And we went down there after my haircut tonight to get ready for you guys. Well, you, look, you look very nice with your hair. Oh, thank you very much. We went to the, uh, this restaurant. We go to there, and they're not perfect mashed potatoes, but they're pretty good. Uh, they're pretty clean. We had mashed potatoes with mushrooms and spinach just about half an hour ago. And we were going to stay at home tonight. And Mary makes with her Instant Pot, she makes uh, mashed potatoes out of whole potatoes. And then we have mashed potatoes. We're going to have sliced green beans with them tonight, along with her golden gravy. And that would have been a whole, our whole dinner. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It was when we went to this restaurant, which was, uh, as I say, it wasn't perfect food, but it was, it was pretty decent. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Didn't, so kill, any, didn't kill any animals. <laughs> <laughs> and the animals thank you for that. Um, well, no, it's become a real issue. Like when you hear today, today in the paper about what 480 different species of birds are going to disappear from the North American continent. Uh, it's a, we're going we're gonna to talk about that, about what, what we can do for global warming in, in a few minutes, because okay. that's, all, that's all I can think about anymore. Um, my next question is, are nightshade plants dangerous? No, they're... They're fine, you just don't want to eat spoiled potatoes. Uh, there's a green uh, a chemical called solanine, which forms under the skin of potatoes. So they say nightshades are uh, green peppers, uh, tomatoes, uh, potatoes, and uh, I don't know what else, tomato seeds. I, I probably mentioned potatoes. Uh, I've never found the nightshade theory very helpful. Uh, people recommend it for arthritis. I've never find, found it helpful. We take care of our inflammatory arthritis patients like rheumatoid and lupus with a diet uh, free of oil and animal foods, and they do just fine. So I haven't found that theory of uh, nightshades to be helpful on any of my patients. Okay. Yeah, but hey, won't hurt you to try it. Right. Another, thank you. Another question is um, about dietary salt, thought, salt. What is your thoughts on that? Well, I think salt... Uh, there's a uh, newsletter in my, on my website called uh, Salt, the Scapegoat of the American Diet. And uh, the problem is the company that salt keeps, most of the salt, 75% of it that people eat comes in the form of processed meats and cheeses, et cetera. So it's the fact that the salt runs around with saturated fat, cholesterol, and you know, dirty animals that is the problem. Uh, there's actually good research that says that a very low salt diet or, you know, recommendations for the typical low salt diet may be harmful for your health. Uh, you remember you have taste buds on the tip of your tongue, which taste with pleasure salt. God did not make a mistake. Those taste buds are there for a reason. You are uh, naturally designed as seekers of salt. 
you like salt. In fact, if you don't like the food that we recommend, it's because you're missing the salt. So we put salt on the salt shakers on the table at our program in Santa Rosa where we take care of people during our 10 day program. And uh, anyway, you can look at the Ann Hain study or various other research and you can show, you can see clearly that low salt diets could be detrimental to your health. And likewise, I think in the other end of the spectrum, very high salt diets can be detrimental to your health. Uh, however, some very, very, very low salt diets can have a profound effect on your health. And that would be Walter Kempner's work where he used to wash the rice to get the sodium off. Mm -hmm. you know, but then again, I think you're dealing with other issues there. So you can use salt to manipulate blood pressure. The drop in blood pressure from the typical reduction to a low salt diet is the top number is about three millimeters of mercury and the bottom number is about a half a millimeter of mercury. So low salt diets are not very effective unless you get extreme low salt. And as I say, you're designed as a salt seeker. I don't think that was a mistake. I think if you deprive yourself of salt, you deprive yourself of a, a lot of pleasure and maybe put yourself at uh, more detriment for, uh, for problems, health problems. So um, are you suggesting then, rather than cook with salt, that you actually use it as a sprinkling on top of your food? Well, that's what we do, uh, just to you know, cover all bases. Yeah. You know, with the idea that too much salt is, probably, is not good for you. And again, I think that's because it's associated with salami and Parmesan cheese and things like that. Uh, and so to err on the safe side, what we've always done is recommend that we, we cook a, a very low salt diet, except for the use of soy products, soy sauces. And uh, what we do is we put the salt shaker on the table, as I mentioned at the clinic. Yes. And somebody may end up taking a half a teaspoon of salt, spraying it on the surface of their food. Well, you know, that's 1,100 milligrams of sodium. That's a lot of salt, half a teaspoon in a day. But if you match that with what we feed people, we feed them a diet that's 500 milligrams of sodium. You add another 1,100 for the half a teaspoon of salt, now you're up to 1,600 milligrams of sodium. If you have a heart attack and end up in the coronary care unit, you serve 2,000 milligrams of sodium. So, I mean, you know, it's all relative. Uh, low salt is, um, you know, our diet is low salt even with a half a teaspoon of salt added to it. Well, that's a very nice background. Anyway. And not bad. Okay. So, um, just another thought around annual flu shots. What's your thought about that? Uh, well, I, I've, uh, you know, all, <clears throat> again, people get a little bit mixed up about what I say. Uh, uh, I, don't, I, I don't think you ought to throw the baby out with the bath, bath water, so to speak. There have been uh, three things that have made a difference in the incidence of disease in human history. There are better sanitation, improved, improved nutrition, and immunization, okay? Uh, otherwise, any kind of treatment, except for maybe treating syphilis with penicillin, has not resulted in any decrease in the incidence of any diseases worldwide. So, you know, why throw the baby out with the wash water? Vaccinations uh, are an extremely valuable tool. I've seen polio, I've seen diphtheria, I've seen tetanus, I've seen hepatitis, these are real diseases. So all my children and grandchildren are fully immunized with a full spectrum of, uh, of illnesses that I think they should be protected from. But nobody in my family gets flu shots. And the reason is, is because uh, they're ineffective. And the reason they're ineffective is because they're based on viruses that uh, occurred, you know, two or three or four years before. So, uh, you know, they're, they're, not, ex they're not effective. Uh, they have uh, often have aluminum in them. In fact, I can't remember what all of them do. They often have mercury in them, particularly if they're in the bottle. Or no, not in the bottle. I just right. Anyway, I, I don't recommend flu shots to, uh, uh, to my family or to my patients. They just don't work. And you ought to get a hint that there's some kind of scam going on when you walk to your grocery store and they say 10% on off all your groceries if you get a flu shot. Well, excuse me, there's got to be a vested interest there. Yeah. You know, so uh, anyway, you'll, look, you'll uh, read in my newsletters why I don't recommend the flu shots. But again, it's not a casual conclusion. I'm a very strong believer 
in uh, vaccinations. Right. Just ones that work and do more good than harm. I appreciate you defining the two. So um, our next question is, can you speak to the idea of fats for good brain health? And along that line, healthy fats versus bad fats. Well, <clears throat> uh, in the context that most people think of fats, they're all bad. And that would be fat removed from the food, mm -hmm. free fat, like lard or olive oil or corn oil. When the fat is mixed up in the food, it has all kinds of different uh, qualities to it. Uh, particularly if the oil is mixed up, say in an orange or in a potato or you know, a vegetable food, then it has, it's, uh, it's residing in a melu, in an environment of other minerals and vitamins and phytochemicals and so on, that the oil, say in the corn or the avocado, is absorbed in a healthy manner, all right? If you take and strip the oil out of the corn or the olive or the orange, et cetera, and you leave everything else behind, then you're dealing with a isolated concentrated nutrient. And the, these isolated concentrated nutrient, concentrated nutrients are best medicines at worst, they're, excuse me, at best they're medications, at worst they're very serious poisons. Uh, oil, <clears throat> well, we're talking about oil, like, that's a, like liquid plant fat, you think about oil. Uh, uh, your omega-3 oils will cause bleeding. In fact, you, you can have fatal bleeds. Uh, those are your fish fats. And your omega-6 fats, which are like your corn oil fats, they actually uh, hurt the arteries worse than animal fat does. Mm -hmm. So all these fats make you fat. The fat you eat the fat you wear. There are isolated concentrated nutrients. They're not food. Uh, so I would, uh, I would not say there are any good fats or bad fats. I think they're all bad fats when they're free of their natural environment. Okay? Uh, we have a certain requirement for fat in our diet, but just tiny, really tiny. It's like 0.05% of our calories or something it has to be essential fat. And uh, like rice is 5% fat, half of it's essential fat. You know, so there's loads of fat in plants, and we need that fat because we, we actually absolutely require plant fats. Uh, but they need to be in the plant when you eat them. Okay. So actually, it sounds like there's a similar parallel when people talk about sugar. When sugar is in the nat whole yeah. fruit, that is okay to absorb because we're absorbing it with all that fiber and all the other rich nutrients. If it's extracted from there, that's when we end up having more problems. Well, it's like when we went to uh, when we went to Peru, you could, you could buy cocoa leaves on the streets. Right. And I mean, the, the native population had no trouble at all with cocoa leaves, but it happens to be one of the big scourges for our population is when you refine the cocaine out of the cocoa leaves. Mm -hmm. So if you refine the sugar out of the plant, of course only plants make sugar, uh, then of course you're dealing with something similar to cocaine out of cocoa leaves. You know, but, uh, anyway, you get the analogy. Yes, thank yeah. you. So. There's a, where did the concept complete protein come from? And how do you argue that fruits and vegetables are complete protein also? Well, this is a real important issue. Um, and I'm dealing with it almost daily uh, with people. And I, I'll mention to you that I just uh, had to deal with the American College of Lifestyle Medicine over this. Do you know who they are? Yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, in their manual, their second edition of their manual, uh, they have a paragraph, only one paragraph, about complete amino acids. And they warn people against uh, getting all their amino acids from plants because they're not complete. And then they used a reference that I wrote in the year 2002 in the journal Circulation, the American Heart Association Journal. By the way, my reference and paper said the ex exactly the opposite. So I just took the argument. I said, look, you guys have a manual. You're teaching all of your prospective accredited residents from this manual. You're teaching everybody that plants don't have complete amino acids. Here's the data, here's the paper, the arguments. I got them with the Heart Association, what, uh, 10 years ago, it was 2002, so seven years, nine years ago. And uh, how the American Heart Association reversed their policy 
and they now say the plants have all the amino acids, but it took me a year or two to argue with them and to fight with their nutrition committee and to basically embarrass them in public before they'd admit it. And now I'm dealing with the same thing with the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, the American Council on Exercise, they all have this wrong. And this is important because people buy foods based on protein. Yes. If you look at the sales, you find that high protein foods have been a selling point, particularly since 2008. So the more protein, the more sales. But protein is very harmful to the body when taken in excess. Mm -hmm. And when you believe that the only way you can get all your protein, your amino acids is from animals, then you set yourself up with some real problems because you have to eat animals now, which gives you problems with your own health, the planet health, and of course the animal's health. Uh, so anyway, this kind of misinformation carried by reputable organizations like the American Heart Association, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, the American Council on Exercise, and the other organizations, they are just too stupid and lazy to go out and find out the truth. And I really mean it. I said, look, you know, I figured all this out 40 years ago. The research was clear then. I don't know why you keep lying to people. And the consequences are not negligible. Huge. Because they cause people to continue to buy into the animal food industry. Yeah, it, that's a huge consequence. Yeah. So anyway, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, they were very appreciative and very apologetic for not only getting it wrong, teaching their, their, res, their doctors wrong, but using my reference from the American Heart Association Journal circulation to support wrong ideas. They didn't read my paper. <laughs> so I was, to say the least, ticked off. Well, I'm, I'm really glad you, you uh, asserted yourself for our, all of our sakes. Well, you know, you're not going to get it. Well, the first thing I'm, I'm dealing, with, as I mentioned, with the climate change, change issue. And I'm going to be, I'm being honored next, the end of the month, uh, for a Lifetime Achievement Award for the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. And I'm going to give them a talk on uh, climate change. Yeah. <laughs> Why the perfect organization to take up the banner? Yes. Uh, you know, we, we've got a, a, an emergency. If anybody doesn't understand we have an emergency, you might as well get off the planet yeah. because it's going to leave you behind. You we're, know, we're in really, really serious trouble. Our, our and, planet uh, is in intensive care. It's, uh, if it's not dead. Yeah. Go ahead. So that actually leads me to a question around soils. And are our soils depleted and therefore a poor quality of food? Do we need to use supplements uh, with vitamins and minerals for our diet? You know, our, our, our plants are so overabundant in vitamins and minerals that even though the soils may be deplete, it's rarely a practical issue. It's never a problem with vitamins because vitamins are synthesized by plants. They're small organic materials. So if, if a plant makes it uh, in life big enough to make it to the grocery shelf, then you can be sure it has all the vitamins because it wouldn't grow. You know, it wouldn't make these organic chemicals. As far as minerals go, you can develop mineral deficiency like iodine deficiency. But it's very rare. I mean, maybe there's selenium deficiency. Uh, there's certainly iodine deficiency that leads to goiters worldwide. But otherwise, it's very, very rare. So even though the soils are definitely damaged, tremendously damaged, uh, the uh, plant foods are so complete that it's not of any clinical significance. Thank you for that. And we should not take vitamin pills. They are toxic. They're isolated concentrated nutrients. They will increase your risk of cancer and heart disease and death. They are dangerous. And so, you know, even B12. I mean, they just an article came out on B12, which I'm having trouble with myself professionally and personally. It was showing the hip fractures were higher in people that took B12. You know, and I've recommended B12 uh, from the last 50 years. I think that's the only one that you do recommend. The only one. But again, that, that has always troubled me because it's an isolated concentrated nutrient. So I don't know, but you know, I, I still leave that well open for discussion, the B12 issue. Okay. Yeah. So I'm gonna lead now to um, some more more personal health issues that people are wanting some ideas on. Uh, one is my son has epilepsy 
and he is bent on eating a keto diet. Any research contrary to indicating this? Well, yeah, there's a lot of research on the keto diet and epilepsy. In particular, uh, epilepsy. Well, I think it's at a Mayo Clinic, if I remember correctly. Um, it's a very effective treatment for really little children, uh, seizures. But the problem is, and this has been addressed very seriously in the literature, is feeding a child a ketogenic diet is a real health hazard. Mm. So even though they discuss the effectiveness of a ketogenic diet in certain epilepsy and young children, uh, every paper I can remember goes into what a serious health hazard it is, creating atherosclerosis and bone loss and set the kids up for kidney stones. And you know, So you're talking about pretty serious medicine. So I would ask your son to, uh, you know, to kind of weigh the benefits and risks of such a diet uh, in his particular situation. It may be that, you know, he's one of those rare individuals that needs a ketogenic diet, uh, but they are very rare. And the, the, uh, any doctor that puts a person on a ketogenic diet, a little kid like that, does so on a very temporary basis. So we have a, no thank you for that. We have uh, another person asking, I have um, halved my cholesterol medication and my cholesterol has gone up and I yep. do not eat any oils, nuts, or avocados. Why is my cholesterol up? Because you decrease the cholesterol lowering medication. Okay. You know, this is why we don't stop cholesterol lowering medication when people come to our clinic. Mm -hmm. So people come to the clinic uh, and we probably... <laughs> 20% or so uh, come with on statins. Maybe 20% have heart disease too. And they'll come to our clinic and we won't stop them the first day because they get discouraged if we do because their cholesterol goes up when they're eating. Now, now I'm not eating any cholesterol, doc, for a whole week and my cholesterol went up. Well, good grief, you just stopped you know, 40 milligrams of Lipitor. Uh, so that's why his cholesterol went up. Uh, the other possibilities are when people change their diet and lose weight, uh, they often mobilize a lot of fat. And in that body fat, it's a lot of cholesterol. So they essentially are eating a high cholesterol diet by eating their own body fat. Mm -hmm. So I sometimes see cholesterol go up under those circumstances. Yes. But in general, we get, well, we know. I mean, we've studied thousands of people of ours. Uh, the average drop of cholesterol is about 20 points in seven days. Seven days. Yeah, yeah so, that, that, that's that's research uh, published on over two thousand people. Right. So, um, so is that person? Would you suggest that that's a matter of keeping up with that diet and just waiting it out to see how uh, your what you need to do? I, I believe it's my May two thousand and thirteen newsletter. That's who should who should take statins. Right. And what you have to do is you have to uh, kind of weigh the benefits and risks, and these will. Uh, the opinion on benefits and risks of statins change almost daily in the medical business. Uh, right now, I believe that they're not recommending statins for primary, primary prevention. But then again, that could have changed since yesterday. Uh, primary prevention is where somebody has not had heart disease and they're put on a statin. Whereas somebody who's had a heart attack or heart disease, you know, there's, I think there's more indication for them to be on a statin because they're at higher risk from another one. So uh, I think you have to weigh the benefits and risks. And a lot of ha this has to do with patients' own feelings about, about their medical care. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, some people, they eat a really good diet and they take good care of themselves and they go, doc, you know, I think considering the way I take care of myself and considering the risks I know about the drugs, the, the drugs outweigh any benefits. The harms do well weigh any benefits. So you know, you've got to involve the patient in there because you're dealing with situations where the outcome could be not what you expect, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not what you desire. So, uh, you know, sometimes I, I will treat based upon patient preference. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, what's your thoughts on uh, intermittent fasting? I don't really know. I, I you know, my general, I, don't take this as an experienced professional. <clears throat> my general thought is that periodic fasting is, uh, you know, uh, uh, an unpleasant day. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I really can't see it helping much at all, uh, unless it leads to a better behavior.
behaviors in the long run. Otherwise, not having food in it once once a week, you know, and that's kind of natural human behavior. Mm-hmm. You know, people didn't have food every day. Yeah. Right. So I, you know, I don't see any long term benefits. Uh, True North, the people are good friends of mine there. Yeah. Have been for thirty five years, they're a fasting place, and it's a great place to get to learn to like our food. Because after you eating water for two, three weeks, our food tastes really good. <laughs> that, that's one advantage. The other thing is, is you know, people sometimes can sort out what their problems are. Yeah. I'll occasionally take a uh, rheumatoid patient or an inflammatory arthritis patient and put them in that situation. Because if they don't get better on a water fast, they're not going to get better. You know, that's just the way it is. Yeah. I guess that kind of leads us to something that, you didn't call it diet, but you called it Mary's Mini. And I'm just oh, wondering yeah. your, uh, sort of what the protocol is for Mary's Mini. Well, you know, that it's called Mary's Mini Diet. Yeah. And uh, uh, Mary and I wrote this maybe 15 years ago, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, to, to, um, you know, I'll offer some quick, simple weight loss. And what it involves, if I remember correctly, is eating one kind of starch. Yes. Yeah. 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 Vegetables. So you would limit your eating to potatoes three times a day or four times a day with a few vegetables or rice four times a day with a few vegetables. The monotony will cause you to lose a lot of weight <laughs> because we know that variety, when you present somebody with variety, they will eat more calories and more food. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, their goal is people are trying to lose weight. They want to do something simple. They want to do something safe. They want to do something they can understand, something that's not expensive. Well, good grief, live on potatoes and water, Mary Minnie's diet. And it's become quite popular, which I didn't doubt when we put it together. Because people like to think in the diet mentality. Okay, uh, you know, summer's right around the corner. It's only eight months away. I got to get a mint bikini. I got 80 pounds to lose. So I'll go on Mary's Minnie diet. All right, fine. But that's eight months. Good grief. Why don't you just go on the regular McDougal diet? In eight months, you'll be down there anyway. And you'll love the food. <laughs> But, you know, people like diets, so it's become real popular. In fact, somebody told me last week that they actually copyrighted the name Mary, Mary's <laughs> Mini Diet. I said, well, fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I'm just wondering, do you feel that there is any health issues associated with eating soy? Uh, well, I do. Um, I think, uh, you know, the soybean is one thing, and then when you start processing it into soy, into tofu, you've taken away the fiber, sold as a separate product called Okara, Okara. And uh, then you sold, then you concentrated it, uh, so it's a 50, 52% fat. And you've taken most of the fiber out, so it's a low fat, 50, low, a high fat, low fiber product tofu is now. But, you know, it's a delicacy. We use it a little bit on uh, it's a delicacy to kind of brighten up the foods. <clears throat> uh, you, first of all, people should know they never have to eat a soybean because when they hear about becoming a vegetarian, they go, oh, I hate tofu. Well, don't ever eat tofu. You never need it. Um, and uh, it, it's just, you know, we kind of add it because it adds a kind of a, a, meat, a meat feeling to the meal. And it makes it more familiar. But uh, I, I don't think it adds anything, and I really don't think it takes much away. I do notice that patients, when they do have some patients, when they do have soy products, they get a lot of GI distress, mm-hmm. and a lot of bowel discomfort, and things. So, you know, I would I would consider an unnecessary food, but uh, one that's tolerated by most people and adds a bit of richness to the meal plan. So. Um- that's very different from isolated soy protein, which you talk about in your starch right. book. Could you just address that for a moment? With well, I, burgers no. like the Impossible Burger and different burgers that are now out on the market that are quite high in fat. Yeah, you know, I haven't looked at those burgers very carefully. I, I did look at the environmental impact. Because as I say, I'm studying for a presentation coming up in about three weeks to give a presentation on the climate. And, um, you know, the Beyond Burger is supposed to be uh, much easier on the environment. Yeah, that's what they say. Yes. The possible Burger too, And that's good. Uh, the thing is, is uh, I think this is totally the wrong approach. 
to make fake meats or, or things that look like animal foods. I, I don't think you, first of all, can keep up. You know, it's just, it's just so many people. And, uh, you know, there'll be so much beyond beef to make, et cetera. Whereas what they ought to be, and, and plus it's not going to give them the nutrients that a, a human being needs. A human being is a starch eater. So the simple solution would be for Bill Gates and Melinda to come out and say, look, you ought to eat you know, baked potatoes instead of impossible burgers. Yeah. Uh, but you know, they, they figure it's a business and it, it, it's gonna make a difference in people's lives. And it's already brought a lot of attention to folks, but you're not gonna solve you know, the problems we have now by uh, switching to impossible burgers. Right. And, and besides that, why would I want something that looks and tastes and stinks like meat? Ah. So that actually leads us talking about the starch solution. Can a diet high in carbs result in uh, diabetic conditions? No, in fact, a diet high in carbs does the opposite. If you look at the worldwide, you see the instance of uh, type 2 diabetes, which is where people get too fat, is obviously due to eating rich food, not enough carbohydrate. Uh, Back in 1980, fewer than 1% of the population of China had diabetes. Back in 2013, JAMA reported that 12% have diabetes. Uh, so anyway, uh, uh, I'm sorry, what was your question again? Um, I was wondering if the high carbs uh, can result in diabetic conditions. Oh, no, they do, no, it, it does the opposite. Uh, carbohydrate makes insulin work more efficient. Uh, we get, uh, as our paper, our published papers show, we get nearly 90% of people off all of their diabetic medication or reduce it. These would be type two diabetics. So no, no, it, uh, carbohydrate, actually pure white sugar makes insulin work more efficiently and fat actually paralyzes insulin. Right. So. Um, that actually leads us talking about sugar. We're wondering about honey. Does honey fit with a whole plant-based diet? Well, except for the animal rights issues. Yeah. yeah. Now, as far as I'm concerned, honey is brown sugar, white sugar, maple syrup, it's all the same. But there are animal rights issues to honeybees. And, you know, I, I, I've gotten past the point of arguing with people about animal rights because every time I did, I was wrong. They were right. You know, the animals did have rights. You know, they do have rights. I, I don't, I, I, I used to think I had the birthright to kill and eat animals, you know, like all of us did. And that was a shame. I was raised with that kind of thinking. <clears throat> um, we know that you are uh, the father of, I believe, three children. Yes. And you have, grand, and you have grandchildren. And we're wondering, seven, seven grandchildren, congratulations. <laughs> We're wondering about strategies for kids and how to get them to eat a whole plant-based diet. Your thoughts? Well, the kids, you know, first of all, kids should be breastfed. Everybody knows that. And breast milk has a lot of sugar in it, so they love it. It's good taste and stuff, so I hear. It certainly comes in a nice container, so I hear. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that is without question what a baby should be eating is breast milk for the first two years of life. Uh, then, of course, whatever mom and dad eat, whatever's in the home is what the child's going to learn to eat. In our home have to be the foods that we eat, and so our kids learn to like these foods. And here at 34, 36 to 44 years old, <coughs> the three children, uh, they all eat extremely healthy. And they're in, and they pass it on to their kids. So all, all seven of our grandkids eat really healthy, too. Uh, Anyway, having the right foods in the house is, is the important thing. And, and kids like simple foods. They love, in fact, they love starches. Uh, you know, they don't like foods touching each other, we found. So we used to have to blend these tomato sauces so they couldn't see the vegetables. But uh, they like simple foods like, for example, we had the grandkids over a couple nights ago for burgers, not, not they made, actually were soy-based burgers made from tofu and oats, not from isolated soy protein. Mary Milton in the kitchen. And uh, the kids had uh, tater tots. And they take them to school and their lunch with some ketchup and uh, they love them, absolutely love them. So the kids naturally like simple starchy foods. 
uh, you have to pervert their tastes to get them to eat uh, you know, chickens and cows and pigs. And even then you have to cover it up so they'll eat it. You know, you have to bread it and butter it and salt it and, Disguise. and hide it some way they'll eat it. Yeah. So I, I, I don't think it's a real, you know, kids love these foods. Now, I have a granddaughter that lives here in Portland. She's seven years old. Uh, she's never ate, eaten an animal ever. I mean, she would. I mean, it'd be it'd be so morally disgusting to her at seven. You know to, that we wouldn't even try. You know, it would it would be uh, an ethical issue for her even at that age. Did any of your children or grandchildren uh, experience any challenges with their peers who were not eating that were eating more? Well, than no, no, uh, actually, they had, I don't think so. Uh, they may tell you differently, <clears throat> but I think the kids actually envied them. Uh, and of course, our kids were the strongest and fastest, and grandkids are the same way. Is uh, they're really physically good because they have their power properly. And they're real trim and strong. Uh, so you know they're looked up up to quite quite a bit. And uh, when they go to a private school and. Uh, or at least some of them do. And I, I, they were, I was at a class uh, graduation for the eighth grade classes about two years ago in uh, Santa Rosa. And this young boy who was a farmer, he got up, it was amazing, eighth, eighth grader, got up and on stage and he talked about how he'd been 4-H, how he lived on a farm. And then the next thing he asked the audience is, how many of you are vegan? And of course, Mary and I and Heather are the ones who raise their hands. And, uh, you know, he says, well, you know, y'all ought to be. And then he gave us a lecture, a half an hour lecture on why he as a farm boy would, uh, is not going to do this anymore. So the kids know. I mean, Greta Thunberg is out on the streets with four million children trying to get adults to wake up. So, you know, it's not a problem with the kids. Yeah. I guess that leads us to... Our last question of the evening, could you talk about a plant-based diet, a whole plant-based diet, and how it affects the environment versus a meat-based diet? Well, you know, we only have one card to play. I mean, we've got lots of cards that need to be played, but we've got one card to play right now, and unfortunately, I don't see anybody playing it. Not even Greta. You all know who I'm talking about, right? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, even Greta, I mean, she talks about how she changed her parents to not eating meat and not flying in airplanes. But that's all Greta would say. Uh, if you look at the Democratic uh, national uh, debates where they're going on right now, we all have all this Green New Deal, but you know nobody really stands up and says, I mean, Andrew Yang did. He says, you need to become a vegan to save the world. But that's about all that's been mentioned. So nobody's talking about it. Yet, uh, you know, Al Gore came out in 2006 and told us all that we were eating the planet to death. Uh, I wrote my first newsletter on how we were eating our planet to death. But Al Gore really didn't touch, Al Gore didn't touch on the, on the uh, livestock issue because he was a black Angus farmer yeah. and quite overweight himself. So, you know, that whole discussion, the inconvenient truth went on without it, really almost any, no discussion about food. And then we have the Democratic National Convention, which, you know, again, everybody's afraid to talk about the uh, electorate's diet. Yeah. Because they're not going to get elected. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, but, but the, uh, in, in the face of this widespread denial that's going on, we have a situation where the World Health Organization told us in 2006 in the Livestock's Long Shadow that 18% of the greenhouse gases are caused by livestock, mm -hmm. compared to 14% for all transportation. We have a situation where the World Watch Institute, shortly thereafter, reevaluated the situation and said over 50% of the greenhouse gases come from livestock. We have the inter International Panel on cl uh, Climate uh, Change that just went on, that just gave the report three weeks ago that said that uh, we've got uh, 12 years left before we get changed or we're finished. And they also said that as high as 70% reduction in greenhouse gases would occur if everybody on planet Earth became vegan. 
Okay. Yeah. So here you have a situation where we have a, uh, we have a tipping point problem. The only card left to play on the table. And the scientists know it, but everybody is afraid to play it because they're afraid they're going to hurt somebody's feelings. And, uh, you know, it, it, and it's something that we can fix tomorrow. I mean, if you and I could take this broadcast we're doing right now and play it all over Canada yes. or the world, and people stood up, your, your prime minister stood up, and you know, prime minister Trudeau. of India stood up, and Mr. Trump stood up, and President Obama stood up, and, you know, all the other leaders in the world stood up and said, look, you idiots. <laughs> You know, I can't believe you're that self-centered. You know, as Goethe says, it's just for the money and the hope that you're going to make more in the future. You know, we could change tomorrow. We could, we could save this place tomorrow, but we can't because we don't want to, I guess. I guess, I don't know. I haven't figured out why we can't yet. Mm -hmm. But I know we want to. I really do know we want to. I know the, the earth is worth saving. And uh, I just think that we have so much wrong thinking out there that uh, <clears throat> we have a tough road ahead of us. And so you 30 people who are listening to me, if, you know, I can tell you have the same concerns I have. But, mm -hmm. uh, go tell everybody. Um, insist that they understand what's going on because, you know, the uh, International Panel on Climate Change says we've got 12 years. I don't believe it. Tell There's you the act truth. actually a new book out on weather and the one of the recommendations they said everybody can start right now is what you put on your plate and yeah. they recommend a whole plant-based diet to make that change well you know that's good but it's not quite right uh, they've got to stop talking about whole food plant-based they've got to start talking about starch yes because whole food plant-based you know could get you you know coconuts or green beans or you're not going to save the world except on a starch-based diet. And you know what I mean by the difference. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, the calories in corn and rice and potatoes will run this planet with 2 billion people on it. Yeah. Uh, but you're not going to run the planet on kale. No, it's uh, the starch is our foundation food to feed. Yeah. 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 So anyway, we, we, we you know, I, I, I just want to leave you on the idea that uh, you know, I listened to James Cameron yesterday, or not James Cameron, uh, Hanson, James Hanson, the original environmentalist. Mm. Okay, he made uh, his set, uh, proclamation to the Senate in 1988 about climate change, global warming. James Hanson. Anyway, uh, you know, he, he has hope. You know, he, he says the world is a, a very sustainable place. And he says, we can fix it. Mm -hmm. but of course, we have to have an, a response equivalent to anything anybody's ever done ever in all of history. Yeah. Uh, but it still can be fixed. I, 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 believe, I, I believe so. I believe that my grandchildren can have a future, but it's going to require an effort. That's, well, I think an effort that's commiserate with uh, what I believe we have to do. And I want to tell you something. I've spent the last, well, my whole career being told I was ahead of my time. And over this climate thing, I've been told for the last 15, 20 years, I've been ahead of my time. Well, I want to tell you something. I'm no longer ahead of my time. The whole world, as I listen, now realizes we are in a crisis that is almost impossible to fix, except for the diet card. Remember, the International Panel on Climate Change three weeks ago said that we have the potential to drop the global warming gases by 70% overnight with a change in diet. Yeah. Wow, that's very inspiring that's and hopeful. Yeah, it is. Oh, so I don't care about the next gallbladder attack I see or the next heart attack. I want to save the future for my children yes. and grandparents. That's and so that's yeah. a great cause, and I, and I think it's something that we all want to see. We can benefit from our health, but the health of the planet, too. Well, you know, the other thing is, I, I, put, down this, uh, I put, a, put together this slide presentation for last week, and I gave a couple of talks. <clears throat> I got standing ovations for them, too. 
But uh, what I pointed out is that you folks are, are, are willing, and when I say you, I don't mean you people in the room, but you're willing to die for yellow and brown food. Yellow and brown food, the taste of grease and salt. It's disgusting, it's malodorous, it's just, it's, it's uh, you know, in every aspect, unpalatable. And we're willing to sacrifice our children's future for this disgusting, unpalatable way of eating. Yeah. You know, for something good, like strawberry ice cream, covered with chocolate, maybe it would be worth it. But not that dead up the animals. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, you're getting me excited. I better go. <laughs> I want to, on behalf of everyone here in Calgary, Alberta, this is called beef country. Yeah, and, well. And, and, but we're going to make it plant country for sure and starch country. So we want to thank you so much for giving so generously of your time, but for not just today and tonight, but all the work you've done and the difference you've made in so many people's lives. Well, thank you for giving me the chance to share a little bit more. And, uh, you know, as I say, we can fix this. Well, let us give you applause so you can hear. Oh, a standing ovation. Uh, thank you all very much, very much. And, thank and, uh, you so much. I'll be looking forward to the next time we can get together. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, folks. Bye. Bye.